Okay, uh, thank you all. Uh, welcome to the afternoon session of the National Marxist School. Um, my name is Anita Waters, um, and I was originally going to, uh, planning on um, doing this uh, presentation this afternoon on the evolution of the democratic struggle alongside Tony Pesanovsky. But unfortunately, to Tony has COVID and is not feeling well today. So I have looked over um, his, his uh, material that he was going to cover, and it's very comprehensive, and I'm sure it's ready for publication. So, um, so I anticipate that that will be published in um, some venue uh, to be announced in the future. So I'll stick with my original subject, which is really strategies of the ruling class and the democratic struggle. Um, we have, uh, well, just to introduce myself, I'm the chair of the, the Ohio district, and I studied sociology, Caribbean politics, and um, in um, po political culture in, in graduate school. So I do draw on my experiences uh, in Ohio, in Florida, where I sometimes spend time, and also in the Caribbean area. So this is a great week to talk about the, this struggle for democratic rights, because with this week and the, the uh, uh, Supreme Court decision that was leaked, we see on the horizon very clearly the erosion of rights that working people have by, uh, worked so hard to win. Um, and the Supreme Court seems to want to roll it back to 1787. And the will of the majority uh, is cavalierly disregarded. So it's a, it's a really good time to address these questions. So let me um, take you on the first slide. Uh, let's see. Um, this will give you some idea of our path for today. Uh, we're going to talk about, well, what is the ruling class? Those two elements, the ruling class and the democratic struggle. We'll, we'll define what we mean by those two uh, things. Um, then we will talk about the strategies that the ruling class uses in its fight against uh, democratic uh, struggle, the democratic movement, the movement for, for more rights uh, and by working people. Um, and I have uh, seven strategies here. They're not all of equally equal importance, but we'll we'll just go through those uh, this afternoon. So um, let's see. First, let's start with the ruling class and and what does the ruling class uh, consist of? Um, the ruling class as a, is an entity unto itself, and it consists of those who control the means by which a society produces and distributes goods and services. Um, and in turn, that uh, that ruling class controls the rest of the uh, society, um, the rest of the population, sometimes through coercion, violence, exploitation, and cultural domination. In feudal societies, of course, the ruling class consisted of those who produce, who control productive land and who extract the value of people's labor in uh, the form of rents and tributes. But of course, in industrial society, the ruling class um, consists of banks and other financial institutions, industrial corporations, uh, large agribusinesses, and distribution networks like Amazon. Uh, the ruling class has used its wealth and military might to nestle, quote, paraphrasing here, nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, establish connections everywhere, to paraphrase Marx and Engels. They exploit the people they encounter around the world and basically steal their resources. So our program um, says, uh, and I just want to read this little quote, the U.S. working class and people are oppressed by one of the most controlling, entrenched capitalist ruling classes ever concentrating enormous political, economic, and military power in the hands of a few transnational organizations, uh, corporations, led by global finance banks and the politicians who do their bidding. Now, of course, the ruling class is not always unified. It's sometimes quite segmented. You remember Dimitrov uh, identified um, uh, fascism as a phenomenon of a segment of the ruling class. Um, and the ruling class in turn uses racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, anything it can to divide the ruling class and um, weaken it. Okay, so since the, since the um, 
the, the, the ruling class in the U.S. suffered some setbacks uh, up in the 60s and 70s, but it really came roaring back in power during the Reagan administration. Um, and you can see from this uh, chart how uh, the, the, the share of wealth held by the top 1% has gone up and up every uh, year since the 1970s. Um, the U.S., uh, okay, the, the, the ruling class in the 70s brought in think tanks, and um, eventually they endowed conservative institutes at, at colleges. They brought in the religious fundamentalists who fomented this moral panic over abortion that we're dealing with right now. And that kind of moral panic deflects attention or has deflected attention from the profits that this ruling class was amassing all those years. The newly invigorated ruling class used government power to break unions and at every chance they undermine the role that government has in making lot workers' lives better. And I wanna emphasize here, the ruling class is an agent of social change as a class. Uh, we analyze in Marxist-Leninist analysis, uh, we analyze society from a structural point of view, not looking at necessarily individual members of a class, the dynamics of social change as they're understood and explained by Marxist-Leninist analysis really aren't concerned with one, whether one person is working class or ruling class, but instead how their actions contribute to the working, the working power of the working class or the movement of the working class or to the repression and uh, exploitation of the ruling class. And of course, as individual, so social class isn't some isn't a characteristic that each individual has. It, it can seem that way, and but but there are class traders on both sides. Of course, was was Friedrich Engels a member of the ruling class? He was a mill owner, but as Karl Marx's partner in theorizing, he was the ultimate class trader. And what about Enrico Tario? You might not know his name. Uh, but he's an African-American from Miami who grew up in a working class neighborhood. Um, and we can say, can we say he's a member of the working class? He's the chairman of the Proud Boys, <coughs> an organization that's doing the work of the ruling class. He heads up a white supremacist, um, male supremacist, fascist organization. Now, Enrico Tario doesn't own the means of production. So in a sense, he's a working class person but he serves in the interests of those who do own the means of production. So wittingly or not, he does their bidding. So that's the ruling class. Let's turn our attention to the other uh, element in that title, and that is the democratic struggle. And of course, democracy, as we all learned, uh, is from the Greek words for government or authority of the people. It's a form of government. I, a theoretical form of government in which the voice of the people shapes the affairs of government, which in which all citizens have equal rights before the law and uh, the will of the majority uh, prevails. Democracy has been seen as a social, philosophical, political and economic system. Um, but we recognize in Marxist Leninist analysis that economic relations change first and they are the driver of other forms of change, including political forms. So Lenin argued any democracy as a form of political organization um, of, uh, ultimately serves production and is ultimately determined by the production relations in a society, in a given society. Our role as communists is to unite the working class, to increase its autonomy, um, and independence. Uh, uh, oops, I went a little too fast. A revolutionary majority is our goal, one based on mass organizations and political parties, one that will make it, quote, make it politically impossible for the ruling class to use political or military means to return to power, unquote. That's from the program. We are working towards the establishment of a socialist democracy, something uh, described as one in which citizens' rights are not just proclaimed, but are consolidated by law and secured by the fact that exploitation by pro private employers is ended and that the cat crises of capitalism have passed. Um, and that's uh, from the, the website, which is always a good source. Um, as you know, and 
will read in Tony's uh, work, um, our country's revolutionary history is characterized by massive struggles to protect and expand democracy from adding the Bill of Rights to the Constitution, to the referendum uh, in the past few years to establish voting rights for uh, felons in ex-felons in Florida. So it stands to reason that if the working class is the vast majority of people, how could it be defeated in a country that purports to be not just a democracy, but the greatest democracy on earth? How is the working class voice silenced and how is its power undercut? And we find that the ruling class has its methods and that's what we're gonna talk about for the rest of this talk. In this paper, I'm focusing on some of the specific ways that the ruling class has shaped the US as a state, as a nation and as an imperialist power, both historically and in the current day. Specifically, how has it worked against the struggle for greater power of the, the working class? How has it managed to put into place what D. Miles calls uh, the, quote, maneuverings and manipulations that divide us, unquote? The ruling class is in a constant struggle uh, to contract the electorate, to shrink it, to cur curtail civil liberties, um, and to give the rich every opportunity to dominate elections and uh, and you know, dictate uh, policy. Democratic rights in capitalist society are under constant attack. So if democracy is said to mean uh, people actually having power in government, how can we measure that? Uh, for bourgeois political scientists, usually if a society holds elections, however badly they are run, uh, they're counted as a democracy. So uh, when I was in graduate school, I studied Jamaican elec elections in Jamaica in the post-colonial era. And um, it was a time that uh, the US praised Jamaica for uh, its quote, sed steadfast commitment to, to uh, democratic traditions, unquote. But it was clear on the ground that the contests uh, that they called elections never um, gave a chance for the will of the people to be expressed. Instead, institutions set up by the ruling class and approved by the colonial powers chose the candidates, arranged for their victories, and for the most part carried on, as usual, their dictating of policies. Still, when the masses were mobilized and activated and politicians felt compelled to listen to them, significant advancements were made in the conditions of the working classes in, uh, in, in those years I studied, which was before it was shut down by the ruling class in turn. So I'm gonna turn now to these seven, um, seven uh, ways that the ruling class uh, represses democracy. And I forgot to mention at the very beginning is, D gave, me, uh, gave us all uh, different ways of organizing our, our presentations. And the way I'd like to organize it is, I, I, I thought I might be um, presenting alongside Tony, so I wanted to race through it. So I'm gonna go for about 37 minutes total, I think of 38, 39, you know, no, no more than 40 minutes. And then we'll, we'll be able to take your questions and comments, and then I'll comment, um, I'll, I'll return and try to summarize at the end. So I hope we have some really good discussion. And, you know, I have some obscure examples of these um, uh, ruling class methods, and you may have better examples, and it would be great to, to hear those. Okay, so um, if democracy means majority rule, what does the ruling class do when elections are actually used to challenge the economic and social status quo? Thinking about this made me think back to Eddie um, Carthen. Um, some of you might remember Eddie Carthen. He was uh, elected mayor of Chula, Mississippi in 1976. He was the first black person elected mayor in Chula, Mississippi, a small town um, since reconstruction. Um, and uh, it was a great victory for him. But after his election, the white remnants of the local plutocracy just stepped in immediately and said, you know, no way, this is just not going to happen. They locked him out of City Hall. They hounded him. They brought him up on trumped up charges and they sent him to prison. 
And you'll see here in the in the present um, in the on the slide, John Wojcik recently reprinted this article because he said it was one of his very first articles for the um, for the People's World. It was I think published in 1982. This was Eddie Carthen was a big um, uh, case that the National Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression worked on in the 80s. Um, so I looked up, uh, by the way, I looked him up, what is he doing now, Eddie Carthen? And um, turns out years later, in 2015, he was elected again. He was elected this kind of time Holmes County Supervisor. And after four years of public service, the state auditor of Mississippi said that his election was fraudulent because he filed a paper wrong. And he had, they were demanding that he repay all of the salary and benefits he had gotten in the years that he was serving in that, in that role as a public servant. So I have some questions out. Uh, this was a couple of years ago. I have the feeling it's just been delayed because I have not heard anything. And my inquiries to some uh, folks down there didn't get responded to. Um, but it just goes to show he's still being pounded. Uh, uh, and of course, we, we learned in, in January 21 that the outright overturning of the will of the majority of voters is a threat, even at the level of the highest elected official. So that's, um, that's our first category, overturning elections. Let's turn to the limits on the franchise uh, that have been established. Um, for those who want to attack democratic rights, of course, the limits limiting the franchise, uh, making fewer people eligible to vote or um, or making sure fewer people vote, period, is an obvious strategy, something that the ruling class um, has used to disfranchise working class people since the colonial origins of this country. And in, in Boston, even before uh, the United States was established in, in the early 1700s, wealth and was consolidated in the top 1%, top 1% of the population owned 44% of the wealth. So that makes it even worse than what we saw earlier in that, in that chart about 19, uh, about 2020, 2018. Um, voting rights, of course, were limited to white men who owned property. When the, um, in the South, uh, fear of a black white alliance led the Virginia Assembly to pass the so-called slave codes, which involved discipline and punishment applicable only to the enslaved. And also they passed laws that gave indentured servants who were white for the most part, specific advantages when their terms of indenture were over, including free land grants. When the constitution was uh, drawn up in 1776, it consolidated and institutionalized a set of power dynamics that included, in Howard Zinn's words, quote, the inferior position of Blacks, the exclusion of Indians, and the establishment of supremacy for the rich and powerful in a new nation, unquote. Most of the men who wrote the Constitution represented uh, men of wealth in land, slaves, manufacturing, or shipping, according to Zinn, and some represented extreme wealth, like George Washington was the wealthiest man in the hemisphere. They constructed a federal government structure that protected their specific interests. Uh, namely, they gave protective tariffs to the manufacturers. They gave protection from land for land speculators against Indians, security against slave revolts for the plantation owners, and of course, women, uh, the enslaved, people without property, all of these people were excluded from all aspects of the process. There was a brief period after the Civil War when Blacks in the South voted, when uh, racially mixed uh, public education was introduced. The 13th Amendment outlawed slavery and the 14th declared all persons born or naturalized in the U.S. Uh, were citizens. Um, something uh, Donald Trump wanted to overturn. Uh, the 15th Amendment declared, quote, the right of citizens of the United States to vote uh, shall not be denied or abridged by the U.S. or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The first Civil Rights Act the outlaw, that outlawed the exclusion of Blacks from a public accommodation 
was passed in 1866. But of course, soon after Lincoln's death, Andrew Johnson became president and he started rolling back the gains. And then I jump in my, in my uh, text here to 1940, forgetting to mention that women struggled to get the vote, sometimes with really um, poor, poorly constructed arguments. Um, and uh, and that, that occurred in 1919. But by 1940, just concentrating here on the, the exclusion of black Americans, only 3% of eligible African Americans in the South were registered to vote. Jim Crow laws like literacy tests, poll taxes, violence and intimidation kept African Americans from voting. Um, those limits um, on voting on the, the, the franchise among workers really had lasting effects. Um, it's pretty well known or accepted uh, idea among political scientists. And here I am quoting uh, Francis Fox Piven and Richard Cloward. They say the partial disfranchisement of working people in that early part of the 20th century. Uh, it was a time when socialist parties and labor parties were being developed in Europe. And because of our, our disfranchisement of working people, um, that helps, that for Francis Fox Piven and Richard Flower helps, helps explain why no comparable labor-based political parties were established in the United States. So, uh, Anita, I, Anita yes, you, yes. You, may, you may be putting your papers over the mic Please be oh. careful. Okay, I'll try to I'll, I'll try to be like this. Is that better? Yes. Okay. All right. Um. Well, I was going to say, Andrew. Uh, I was going to refer again to Tony's uh Tony's talk that you're not going to be able to hear uh, right now, uh, but he will talk in in his article that is coming out about how um victories like the 1965 Voting Rights Act uh, were um, learn uh, were reached. Um, now, legislative efforts to limit the franchise are alive and well today. Uh, despite Florida's, um, here's another picture of, um, yeah, DeSantis. This is Ron DeSantis, of course, the mayor of, uh, I mean, the governor of Florida. And on the right, Kelvin Bolton. Despite uh, Florida vo voters' overwhelming support of a referendum that allowed ex-felons the right to vote, uh, the DeSantis government, right after uh, after that vote, passed a rule that said they couldn't vote until all their fees were paid and fines. And people leave Florida prisons owing thousands of dollars that they're never going to repay to the state. And in this one case, Kelvin Bolton, He's an ex-felon with a history of, of mental illness and cognitive challenges. And he was persuaded to register to vote as he left prison. And um, he was happy to vote. He was glad to be able to, to uh, he registered Republican and he, um, he uh, cast his vote. But, uh, but then later he was charged with voter fraud and fined thousands of dollars more. And DeSantis here is is having basically a war on voting in every on taking every step he can. And um, this this man Bolton is is one of many people who have been singled out for prosecution. So the next um, uh, type of of response I I've looked at a little bit is and we're, there's so many examples of this and that's violence and intimidation. Um, the ruling class doesn't usually do its own dirty work, but ruling class henchmen are brought in to do their bidding. In the civil rights era, the so Southern white oligarchy used its economic power to organize the KKK and other terrorist groups. The NAACP reports that between 1882 and 1968, there were 4,743 lynchings in the United States. That is extrajudicial killings. Uh, the horrors of the of Bloody Sunday when police beat up voting rights marchers on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in 1965 was a signal incident, incident in the fight for uh, voting rights. But mobs and police were not the only forces employed to break working class power. In the late 19th century, corporations formed private armies uh, 
uh, to use force to break unions. And most uh, notoriously was the uh, T Pinkerton De Detective Agency, which at one point um, in, I think, the 1880s or so, had more uh, men working for it than the United States Army. Um, corporations uh, like the mines uh, wielded power without interference from the state. And we'll touch on, oops, um, we'll touch on that later um, when it comes to uh, judicial actions. Um, okay, Re representations and propaganda is my next category. And this is, um, in, uh, this is from sort of sociology's version of critical race theory. We have a theory um, that's called racial formation theory, which has a lot of parallels. And racial formation theory um, distinguishes analytically between structures and representations. Structures um, are laws, practices, and institutions uh, that may either well, that may either reinforce racial hierarchy in a society or undermine it. So they may reinforce class hierarchy as well. Um, but they have specific material consequences. For instance, they may extend or shorten people's lives. Uh, they may provide higher or lower wages. They may provide a uh, pension or not a pension. In contrast, representations are ideas, myths and meanings that attach to categories. And representations also may either reinforce um, racial and class hierarchies or they may undermine those hierarchies. And uh, they, they may actually um, give permission to people to support policies that create the structures that actually do have material consequences. So let's talk about representations and propaganda in this case first. During Reconstruction, when African Americans were being elected to legislatures and they were taking part in the political lives of their towns and states, Howard Zinn writes, a great propaganda campaign was undertaken north and south that claimed, quote, that blacks were inept, lazy, corrupt, and ruinous to the governments of the south when they were in office. The ruling class also floated myths of a European class and they brought, at every opportunity, they brought white far, poor white farmers in into a new alliance against blacks. Um, this is one area that's a little, this is off the, the um, well, maybe it's still definitely in the car, uh, category of representations, but I, I like to think about the question that I have had discussions in my, um, in my with comrades about, are members of the ruling class evil? Um, I think evil is a metaphysical term, and so I don't want to use it. Uh, I, I agree that there are lots of uh, corporate power holders who are just completely heartless people, um, like Big Pharma raising the price of, um, of uh, insulin, the oil companies that withhold data about the effects of fossil fuels. These are people we might be tempted to call evil. Um, and they, they seem to go about it with no conscience whatsoever. But there are other parts of the ruling class that are people who are convinced of their own goodness. And they tell themselves, the reason they're, they're convinced of that goodness is that they tell their sel themselves myths um, about why they're entitled to their wealth. They, may, they worked hard, uh, they had the best ideas, they paid their dues in their internships or they paid their dues in their residencies and, and uh, you know, uh, college educations. The concept that wealth is a sign of blessing, furthermore, is an indication, um, I mean, that, that something that has deep roots in American and European uh, culture. This is the idea that um, from the Protestant ethic that um, if you are doing well and you're you're uh, getting you're gaining uh, in wealth, that's an indication that you're among the saved. Um, the Puritans of New England had an outsized influence on the structures that were uh, shaped by representation about class that these people put forth. And I think you could see the prosperity gospel, the so-called uh, prosperity gospel movement, is uh, you know akin to this kind of. Uh, wealth as a blessing because God is smiling on you. 
Um, we saw, all right, as far as media and culture, we saw in, 19, in uh, six, 2016, especially how media are used um, to spread falsehoods that are aimed at contracting the electorate. And you you may have uh, some good examples of that. Um, I, all the examples I could think of were very localized. Uh, there were, you know, uh, Facebook posts about uh, about Democrats and being the same as as Republicans that I think were um, something that that took the wind out of uh, the uh, motivation to vote. Um, our on representations and voting rights in particular, political scientists telling people their vote doesn't matter is one of the most irritating things. It's and it's one that has the effect of contracting democracy and silencing the voice of the people. Between 35 and 60 percent of eligible voters don't vote in any one election, and there are 25 percent of the eligible voters who never vote at all. And many are convinced that their vote doesn't count, uh, and others are daunted by barriers to voting, which gets us to structures, which is the next category that I want to talk about. And remember. <coughs> Social structures are uh, those um, constitutions, laws, bureaucratic practices. They masquerade as idea, uh, as egalitarian, uh, but they end up having outcomes that disproportionately affect working class negatively and, uh, and negatively affect its ability to use its franchise. A study of non-voters showed that factors included, factors that led them to not vote included not being able to get off of work in time or to physically access their polling place or failing to jump through the hoops of early registration or for purged voters like those in Ohio re-registration and making sure you're registered before the the time runs out bureaucratic structures that administer uh, elections may make decisions that make do make decisions that make voting more difficult in areas where working people live. And this happened in Ohio in uh, a really dramatic way in the 20, uh, 2004 election when John Kerry was running against George Bush. George Bush won his second term. Well, yes, I guess he won that maybe a little more validly than the first term. Um, but in Ohio in 2004, we had this uh, Secretary of State, Kenneth Blackman, um, and he had all kinds of rules and regulations. You could not, if you had a voter registration form and it was the, on the wrong stock of paper, then it would be rejected outright. Um, there was a horrible, it was a horrible election um, in 2004. Uh, twice as many people voted as voted in, um, in uh, 2000, uh, but they didn't accommodate them at all. They didn't increase the number of voting machines. So as a result, people waited online in, for hours to vote. Um, and it was raining uh, that day in much of Ohio. I happen to remember this one, especially because my son, so my oldest son's first um, election that he ever voted in, and I think he waited, he, it took him eight hours to get through in the little town of Oberlin, Ohio which is a little a little maybe blue oasis in a red area and that might be why uh the the lines were so long there um and then there's uh by the way that that incident that um election in 2004 I, after that um the ohio voters really did insist on um improvements and as a result we do have a much more generous early voting system here in Ohio. Not early, uh, we don't have registration on demand or same day registration, but we do have um, weeks of early voting. Okay, then there's gerrymandering, which is, um, uh, you know, uh, well, you've, you've heard about this. It's a big problem. That's um, in, I, my, my example again is from Ohio. In Ohio, a huge majority, um, passed uh, a referendum a couple of years ago to establish a redistricting commission. And this was in response to how, how gerrymandered uh, the, the um, state was. Um, 
so by the way but unfortunately the way so this this year is our first year with this redistricting commission after the the 2020 uh, census and um unfortunately the way the law was written there are a lot of loopholes and the gop dominated commission have used every one of them they passed they've passed now three maps um and each one is declared unconstitutional by the Ohio Supreme Court. And now the commission is just waiting it out. They know we have we have to have a we have to have a map in order to have a primary before we have the election. So um so it will probably we we've already had one primary. We're going this would be the second primary, so that will reduce turnout as well. So um so those are some of the things some of the the ways that's happening in um in Ohio. Um, uh, and of course, DeSantis, um, in my second favorite state, he just uh, drew his own map eliminating two African-American districts because he's got so much power in, uh, in Florida that the legislature just does what he says. So um, then we turn to judicial cases. And um, let's see, am I missing something? Oh yeah, I just want to go back to um, to to structures again and say, you know, we're concentrating on these little bureaucratic structures, but we're not just talking about with structural factors. We're not just talking about rules governing elections, uh, but we're talking about the trend since 1970s of a full embrace of neoliberalism, and with it, the decline in union density, the decline in corporate tax obligations, and the deregulation of industry. And these have resulted in a working class that often is working more than one job to meet, make ends meet. Uh, that might mean four or five jobs held in one family and for wages uh, that can buy one less in the marketplace today than they used to. Families, people are impoverished by the process of getting a higher education. And young people are delaying beginning families because of their student loan debt and the high cost of health care and the high cost of daycare, uh, making having children very expensive. And I see this as another side to the coin of reproductive rights. We have to have the right to be able to have families in a, in, and not run ourselves into bankruptcy. I also think that innovation and creativity are stifled by having this younger generation beholden to work for corporate America in order to pay off their student loans and to maintain their health insurance. So I'm hoping this group um, in the discussion will have some other good examples of um, ways that structures uh, limit the size of the electorate and the voice of people in their, the way our uh, government is organized. Um, the judicial, uh, the indifference uh, to the idea of majority rule, we saw that uh, as we said earlier, this was reaffirmed this week with a leaked draft of the Supreme Court decision overturning Roe v. Wade. Uh, the majority of people in this country do not want to see Roe overturned, but their will has been thwarted by courts dominated by jurists who were selected by a president who did not win a majority of the of the electorate, um, and they were these these ju justices were ratified by senators who also represent a minority uh, of the electorate. Um, experts in law say that even if a law is passed by Congress and signed into law by the president, establishing uh, women's bo bodily or people's bodily or autonomy, the Supreme Court could overturn it using the same logic uh, that they are using to justify this decision that was leaked. It's really the first time this will be the first time the Supreme Court, I say one of the first times this, uh, the Supreme Court history in Supreme Court history that precedent has been overturned in such a way that takes rights away from people. Um, and I thought it was the only one people have been saying it's the only one that does that. But then someone pointed out Janus was also taking away the voting rights of, of public workers. So when I was thinking earlier before this week about judicial restrictions on the voice of the working people, what I thought of was, of course, uh, the Citizens United versus FEC. Um, uh, this is the famous uh, corporations are people case. 
in me in uh, January 2010, uh, the Supreme Court ruled in a case brought by Citizens United. Uh, now that was that's a right wing media company that produces some so called documentaries, and they produced a very negative and dubious uh, documentary that they called it a documentary about Hillary Clinton, and the Federal Election Commission forbade it from being aired too close to the primary election day. The court uh, ruled that corporations can spend unlimited resources on election campaigns. With that decision, the Supreme Court overturned election restrictions that dated back more than a century. Uh, it allowed for the establishment of super PACs, political action committees that serve the wealthiest donors, and that expand secret money through nonprofits that don't disclose their, their uh, donors. We see in, in Ohio, again, our, our Senate uh, Republican Senate nominee is someone who was a, a one donor uh, candidate for a long time, but that donor had given $15 million through his super PAC. As a result of Citizens United, the GOP in particular has benefited. A study in 2020 of election results found strong evidence that these regulatory changes increase the electoral success of Republican candidates, thereby leading to a more ideological conservative more ideologically conservative legislatures. So it's just a like a juggernaut, you know, feeding on itself and making things even worse. The FEC, uh, the Citizens United versus FEC ruling, I wanted to quote uh, Associate Justice John Paul Stevens, who declared that the in his dissent, uh, that the court's ruling represented, quote, a rejection of the common sense of the American people who have recognized the need to prevent corporations from undermining self-government. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to also go back to that union busting through, uh, through the courts. Um, judges, uh, when the Pinkerton Detective Agency was doing its worst, judges of that time, when a, when a case did come to to uh, before a judge, judges saw unionization efforts as violations of the property rights of corporate owners. Therefore, corporate violence against workers was treated as ruled as defensive. So uh, that's uh, the result of that. So um, my last uh, item here, and I don't have too much on it, is uh, imperialism as a ruling class strategy to limit democracy. I want to quote our, our program again, which says, despite the trappings of democracy, the US government, like those of other imperialist countries, implements foreign policy as a direct instrument of monopoly capital, enabling the accumulation of capital for the monopolies. And one of the ways it does that is by undermining democratic outcomes in other countries uh, that are, um, you know, that the U.S. may choose to support certain candidates uh, through propaganda and misinformation, uh, violence and assassination. Uh, there's abundant evidence, and these are my two pictures here. There, uh, Michael Manley on the left with Fidel Castro. He was in power in Jamaica prime minister from 72 to 80. And then in 1980, Edward Siaga on the right there was um, elected. Um, but that election campaign uh, was the most violent that was um, had been experienced in Jamaica. There was just a lot of guns on the street. Guns are not manufactured in Jamaica. They come in from, from the United States. Um, and then they also um, brought in thousands of um, of religious workers who um, went into the countryside and their their constant message was to vote for socialism uh, or Jesus Christ wouldn't vote for socialism. That was the bottom line. So um, so that that was a successful way of getting uh, a more U.S. friendly um, uh, prime minister into into office in, in Jamaica. That, that happens all the time. Of course, Haiti. Honduras, Chile, there's innumerable examples of the United States just going in and saying no, just like just like the white plantocracy took away uh, Eddie Carthen's uh, victory as mayor of Chula, Mississippi. Um, and that's one of the most irritating things about 
uh, Cuba for the United States is that um, we can't float our own candidates in, in their elections. So I have my sources here are varied and not in any particular order. Um, and um, but that's about that's what I have for you today. And I am really interested to hear what you have to say. And we can we can all be on. on you know, I, I'm sorry that that Tony Tony's you know uh, complimentary presentation isn't included today. Um, but uh, but I think you could, you will find that in print in the next uh, few weeks, hopefully. So, uh, Dee, that's all I have right now. You want to open the floor? Okay, we'll open the floor for discussion now. Please uh, click the, please use your mouse uh, clicker, your mouse cursor to uh, click the uh, picture of the hand and open your, uh, click the picture of the mic to open the mic on your end. And then because we see the hand, we will open your mic on this end and call your name. And please uh, say what you want to say, but uh, con uh, but uh, briefly. So I'm looking for pictures of raised hands. You can, we have a little more time than we had uh, originally planned. So uh, we will be able to hear more people. Lowell Denny, Click the mic. There you are. Thank you, Anita. Aloha, Anita. Great Hola. presentation. Aloha. How are uh, you, Lowell? So I'm well, thank you. Uh, first, before I ask my question, my mind is blown, and I thank you for sharing that information about Chula, Mississippi. Um, I shouldn't be surprised, but it still made me stand up in my chair. Just um, it sounds like you're doing you're doing some research. Um, about that story and you're following it so i hope to see something in people's world um about it because i'm i'm shocked i shouldn't be shocked but i am shocked anyway my my question or my my in my question my statement is in regards to the structures would you agree that adding the commission on presidential debates um might be one of those structures as i recall that was created by the two parties uh, because the League of Women Voters, which had been conducting the debates, um, had allowed John Anderson into the debates. And um, the threat was, the threat was a third party would um, meet the League's standard to be on the stage. And so the two parties um, conspired to create this corporation to conduct debates thereafter. Would you agree with that's one of the structures? Um, Dee, can I just res respond to that? Maybe if, I should. If you wish, if you wish. Okay. Yes, I just want to say thank you, Lowell. Yes, you're 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 uh, you're right. Actually, I don't know that this. I don't didn't rebrief myself on the specific uh, history of that, but that sounds completely plausible. Um, and I do remember the the you know Anderson's uh, involvement, and um, that is uh, just that's a perfect example of a structure that really really inhibits the voice of the working class. And I, I do agree. I mean, I, I, I will follow up on Chula, Mississippi. I'll, I'll ask John Wojcik, what maybe he knows something more too, since he, he recently uh, uh, resurrected that article. Thanks, Lola. Rachel Burnett, your mic is open. Thank you. Can you hear me? A little mm -hmm. bit louder, please. Okay. Um, so I am from Mississippi. I live here currently, and mm. I am not at all shocked about Chula. Um, was not familiar with it, so I'm, I'm going to do some research on that myself. Um, but I was one of those people that did not feel like my vote counted. I still don't feel like my vote counts here. I vote in every election that I can now. Um, but that's a very recent thing. It started with Trump, and now I vote out of self-defense. Um, so living in a state that is so red, how do you make a difference? How, I mean, I, like, I've, I've tried to organize things. I have, um, like, the last, last time I, I was trying to start a group here, 
two people, two people. And like, there's, there's never, I can't, I can't find people. So um, yeah, just any, any encouragement of how you can, how to get our message out in a place that is so unfriendly to it. And that's all. Okay, thank you, Rachel. And Dee, I, I, I thought I did say that I would collect questions and respond to them later, but I think I might want to just respond to them one at, one at a time, if that's okay. If it's your pleasure, please do. Oh, okay, thank you. So, Rachel, that was really interesting. I'm, I'm glad you're carrying on the struggle in Mississippi, um, and I'm sure it is discouraging. And I think part of um, part of the problem with gerrymandering is that our votes don't don't seem to count. Like I am now in a district, a congressional district that is it. They they took all the the Democratic voters and packed them into one district. Um, so this woman, uh, my my congresswoman, who's who's pretty good, Joyce Beatty. Um, she's a member of the Congressional Black Caucus. She is going to win, um, and there's no doubt about it. Uh, so it, it seems like there's no point in, in, uh, in uh, it seems like your vote doesn't count. I think they're counting on that to decrease interest in the election. So I'm glad you're persisting and voting anyway. Um, and I think one of the ways you can approach that in a red state or a situation like that is by uh, looking at the issues in particular, instead of going you know, left or right or Democratic or, or Republican, um, maybe, uh, maybe looking at, at situations in the, um, what, what, is, what, is, um, what is hurting your neighbors? What is hurting uh, working class people in your community? And how could, um, what demands should they be making to make that uh, a better, um, make their conditions of life um, better and their services from the government better? Um, and I think, you know, trying to organize a, a, your, your neighbors along those lines without introducing Democratic or Republican or communist or uh, socialist idea, you know, labels on anything. I think that is one way. Um, I'm involved in a community in Florida that's overwhelmingly uh, Republican. It just seems like it's it's a county that is like, I think 70% uh, voted for, for Donald Trump. But even that means there's 16,000 people who didn't vote for Donald Trump, who voted for Joe Biden in last election. So there's thousands of people out there who, who are, and they're often have to sort of keep them their, their identity on um, quiet, uh, you know, as in terms of yard signs and things like that. But I think finding those, some of those people and, and getting to work with them on things that are of real importance to their lives um, is a first step. Thanks for your question or your comment too. Thank you. Shay, your mic is open. Shay. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> one of, I'm sorry, got a cough real quick. Uh, one of the most um, uh, particularly difficult parts of the democratic struggle right now is the very violent outbreak of transphobia that's restricting the rights of transgender people to just purely exist. The party resolved to throw itself fully into the struggle, but it hasn't really um, cemented itself in the club. So what can we do or what are you doing to uh, you know, get party members involved in the struggle for trans rights. Mm -hmm. Great, good to hear from you, uh, Shay. I think I agree that um, violent violence against trans uh, trans people and um, and transphobia in general uh, is is really the um, behind the 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 many bills that Republican. Um, state legislatures have come up with. In Ohio, we have them too. Um, and we do have a good, at least in Columbus, Ohio, there are some very good rights, uh, trans rights organizations. And we we make a point in our club, um, the Anahas Morgan Club in Columbus, to, um, to show that we're supportive of other groups' struggles. Um, so when there were, when there were trans rights marches, 
we were there and we were there with our maybe our communist party shirts on or something some indication or where people know know who we are these days um there's a a, a very active group in columbus um so i think we do have to keep those uh those um struggles on the front burner and columbus is a very lgbtq uh rich town uh there are we have two uh sort of competing uh pride parades and uh you know there's there's other activities so we try to we try to be at those activities um and uh be there just to show our support for those struggles i think that's what we need to do and also come out against those bills that are coming out um from the the legislature but thanks for your question it's a really important struggle and i'm glad to see the party has um, reiterated its commitment on that uh, on that front. Okay, I think it's S I G G. Yes, your mic is open. Speak up, please. Yes, yeah, Siggy. Speak up, please. Uh, okay, so thanks for the seven methods for disrupting democracy. We see that not only in the uh, political arena, but in pretty much every arena. Uh, you can see that a lot in labor organizing as well, um, especially the propaganda, the intimidation, overturning elections, uh, mm -hmm. limiting who can vote. Um, I wanted to make a particular case about imperialism and see um, a really good example of that is I think there was an African um, president or prime minister. I don't remember what country it was but he was a bit too friendly with um, socialist countries for the US's liking. I think he was assassinated and the Soviet Union named a school after him. Do you remember, do you happen to know who I'm talking that was about? Patrice Lumumba. Thank you. Thank Dave. you. Sorry. Thank you. No, that, thank you. I'm glad you, you uh, rescued me there. Yeah, yeah, but go ahead. Uh, is that your, um, you want to elaborate um, a little on that? So how do you think um, we can get past the propaganda that the ruling classes like to put on? Well, like the labor movement currently going on. Mm -hmm. Like what's an effective method that we can use to fight that propaganda? Okay. Yeah. Good question. Um, I. We're um, we're very supportive in Columbus of the Starbucks um, unionization efforts that are going on right now in two shops in Columbus, and we have a we have a I don't know whether I'm to, uh, saying something out of turn here, but we have a group chat uh, that involves a lot of community members as well as the organizers. And um, for instance, they they post it. They had a um, Starbucks management put a put a flyer, posted a flyer all about um, how how awful unions are. And so they took a picture of that and put it on the on the group chat and we all get to make fun of it. And I think that really that really helps, you know, sort of um, take the wind out of the sails of, of the end. There's workers. These workers are too savvy for that. They've they've watched the YouTube videos of the anti-union votes, uh, anti-union propaganda that Target and Walmart put out. They're 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 not um, you know born yesterday. They really understand uh what's going on. And I think those kind of voting vote, I mean education, labor education um is really important uh to to counteract those kind of uh, um messages from from management. Um so I think education it's it's um I think you have to well, you, you have to try to you know get out ahead of it and make sure your messages are um, are you know paramount in in what people are receiving. But I really I like your idea about how all of these methods are used against unions, and I, and it's like all of these methods are used against in many ways to to in, disempower workers at every opportunity. So thanks for your question. Okay. Sandra Laycock, your mic is open. Open. There you are. <laughs> um, I want to uh, go back to what you said about characterizing the ruling class members thereof as evil. I mean, I agree, it's metaphysical, but 
the emphasis on the moral dimension is really important, i.e., it's immoral to be spending money on weapons mm -hmm. instead of housing, medical care for all, and so on. And this is especially important if we want to uh, engage with faith groups. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sandra. Of course, you're right. There is a, a moral component here, and and if you um, are if if people who do immoral things are defined as evil, then I guess they would be defined as evil. I just um I you know I I, I just want to I do want to avoid metaphysical concept constructs when I when I can, but I but I know in characterizing the, the ruling class, we do have to emphasize sometimes their greed and their heartlessness and their you know contempt for uh working people and all those are dimensions of immorality and um and also those big uh immoral aspects of spending money on weapons and um and so forth you're absolutely right thank you i think the point you wanted to make too is the point that marx made which is that uh, you can change the individuals all you want and the mm -hmm. same will have the same product because it's the system, the greed, the immorality, the the neglect of of human uh, needs. It's a product of capitalism. So you can change the individuals and put different individuals there, but as a as a as a function of how capitalism must operate, you'll mm -hmm. have similar uh, results. So exactly. I knew you wanted Good to. Good point. Yes. Okay. Good so point. okay. So Tonya, we're opening your mic now. Sorry for the. Tonya, your mic is open. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Tonya, and um, while well, I live in the Northeast now, I am from Mississippi, and mm -hmm. um, so I know Chula very well. I actually know people who go to reunions there often and the like ah. sort. Um, and so there's two things, and then I would have a suggestion, and then I have a, um, I have a, I have a, I have a question. So the one thing briefly, that I would like please. to know, I'm sorry. Briefly, please. Can you? Yes, it will be brief. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you want me to continue? Yes, please, thank please. you very much. Mm -hmm. And so one of the pieces about Chula, and I think that it would be great to use Chula as maybe a case study for um, the National Party to sort of um, to look at, because it would address this issue which you're talking about with politics, but it's economics. The number one um, transactional place in Chula is a liquor store. Most of the people have been disfranchised. Most of the people who are under 35 have no employment. And the nearest um, place that they can go is Jackson, Mississippi, which is the capital, which is over, you know, um, you know, far. It's, it's a distance. So I think like maybe looking at um, looking at Chula as almost like a case study and looking at um, how Marxist Leninism can be used looking at Chula as a case study because it addresses a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. One of the pieces, so that's the suggestion, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at the case study of Chula. Um, and so the next piece will be my, the question that I have is this, uh, one of the pieces that you talked about was that one of the obstructions that's used is um, that people um, why people don't vote. Like um, there's a whole subculture in black community now that really says that they're not voting as a form of protest. And so how do you, how do we, or how can we, um, and I know people who don't vote because they are saying they're not letting the white man, meaning the Democratic or the Republican Party, you know, uh, violate their rights and use them and so on and so forth. And that's a real um, subculture. So, like, how do we address that? Because th that, because in essence, they see their non-voting as a form of resistance and protest, which is actually a part of revolution. Mm -hmm. Well, good questions, Tanya. I really appreciate that. Um, and I, I'm just amazed that there's two people who know something about Chula, Mississippi, on on the uh, in the in the uh, group today. Um, and I will, I have put out calls to um, Frank Chapman and also to a, a journalist who studies 
um, who works for the paper there, and I hope I, I get more information. Um, and it would be it would make an interesting um, uh, case study of um, just overturning elections that don't work out um, as people uh, want them to. Now, this problem in um, maybe in, in the black community, but also in uh, the white community too, of, of you know showing your opposition by not um, voting is something that I'm familiar with. I, I think anybody who's tried to do voter registration on the street uh, and has, have asked people to vote, uh, to register to vote, sometimes you come across people who are not registered and just are determined not to vote uh, for one reason or another. And I, I, I don't have an easy answer to that. I think, um, and I would invite anybody else who's who's on the call who has an answer to uh, to come on and talk about that. But um, but I think you know when you when you look at these very close elections, and I mean, I know it's not very popular to talk about the 2016 election, but um, we're you know we're just. Uh, it was so clear that Donald Trump was intending to uh, to appoint judges who would overturn Roe v. Wade, um, and then with the way Mitch uh, McConnell treated the Merrick Garland um, nomination, it was just uh, I think it was uh, our our the results of that election were to um, to enable uh, the court to do what they're apparently going to do. Um, so I think maybe showing people the uh, also, think about um, one of the things I came across, uh, which I wasn't really studying here because Tony, that was Tony's um, bailiwick here, but um, but how many people struggled and died in the effort to establish voting rights. I mean, they're, they're, um, what about their legacy? And people, people did, were killed in that, in that conflict. Um, you know, when you think about the lynchings that have taken place, um, but also just the struggles in the immediate Voting Rights Act, uh, the after the lead up to the voting civil, civil rights voting rack, the Voting Rights Act rather of 1965. Um, you can see that there's those those lives that have been um, uh, lost or even um, or or just affected. So I think maybe um, maybe telling history a little bit more, and I think. I think we uh, one of the things I'm very interested in is is uh, black history as a revolutionary act. Talking about black history as a revolutionary act, it's happened over and over again. The people are punished for telling telling black history. Now we see it with this critical you know effort to get critical race theory and and black history out of um, schools, um, but it has happened. We um, my club is named after Anna Haas Morgan. Well, Anna Haas Morgan's um, a uh, husband was fired from the Ohio State University um, in the 1940s because he organized a, 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 a exhibition on Black history at the Ohio Historical Center. Um, that was his that was his last act, and it was um, you know it was for teaching Black history. And then there's also Walter Rodney, who got run run out of Jamaica in 1968 for teaching uh, Black history. So I, um, African history to the uh, to uh, Jamaican people. So I think teaching that history and making sure we we uh, honor the the uh, struggles and that have come before us, I think is is one way we could address that. And maybe others have some I ideas as well. But thanks for your question or comments too. Maybe she wanted to. Tonya, did you want to add anything? And yeah. if I'm pronouncing your your name incorrectly, I apologize. But let me go back to her. Tonya, did you want to add anything? Uh, no, I'm just. Um, thank you so much, uh, Anita, for addressing that. The only thing that I would say is that, again, this is this is why I think the party right now we're at a cr critical time because. They, the people that I'm talking about, they literally see themselves in the legacy of Fannie Lou Hamer. I'm going from Mississippians' perspective, right? They see mm -hmm. themselves in the legacy of Megar Evers. They see themselves as their non-vote, meaning that no one can manipulate them. They see it as like a form of organizing, and so, um, and so basically, the the idea of the 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 waving the flag, and they will even tell you the waving the flag of guilt is just is no longer 
something that's on them. That's a tactic that was used in the, you know, 70s and 80s. But mm-hmm. for this millennial district, um, generation is different. So I think that as a as a party, I think it's, it's something that we can do by, uh, that's why I was saying, like maybe looking at some case studies like, you know, Chula and saying, mm-hmm. look, this is what, this is what systems look like. And this is why this is, you know, this is what systems look like economically, politically, and the like sort. But thank you so much for allowing me to come back on, Dee. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have a Tristan. Hold on. Tristan, your mic is open. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yep. Okay. So um, as we sort of like, struggle to build this new labor movement in like the 21st century how will we as marxists sort of keep the workers focused on like instituting or implementing um sorry (laughs) uh qualitative change instead of just quantitative change because couldn't it be argued that the sort of like waves of deregulation and neoliberalization that started in like the 70s and 80s and whatnot um, was a result of the lack of qualitative change in the structure, if that makes sense. Hmm. Like sort of, we, we organized unions and then we sort of stopped there and there was never any broader movement to challenge capitalism and couldn't it be held that that sort of led to its stagnation? Mm-hmm. So then how will we as Marxists keep the working class focused on challenging capitalism and like implementing that qualitative structural change okay wow that's a big question tristan i i'm not sure i could even think of i mean get an approach to that but um you're right that sometimes um unions uh they they get into a a sort of a satisfied um they're satisficing to use a word that uh i don't know some some administrative person used to use, satisficing, which is satisfying and sufficing combined. And um, and they 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 tend to to just go after bread and butter issues instead of looking at the real roots of capitalism and and the, the roots of the the problems of the working class in capitalism. I think one thing is the the thing that we're we're grappling with right now is these crises of capitalism. That go from um, oh it's it's inflation today could tip over into recession tomorrow um, and th- that kind of swing uh, is something that is is unique to capitalism and is something that is really hurting workers. Um, so yeah, as far as qualitative as qualitative change, yes, I I I think I think that qualitative change will emerge. I think I remember. In my uh, readings about historical materialism, there's the idea that um, that quantitative changes will be very uh, will accumulate and then it will like turn over into a qualitative change. So I think as we empower workers, as we empower them to to seize control of their own work um, working lives by organizing um, and bargaining collectively with their employer and get a sense of efficacy in terms of community organizations um, and and other you know intermediate organizations that can actually get something done i think that empowerment uh will eventually and automatically almost kick over into a qualitative change and a, a you know an uh an in, an intolerance of continuing to uh to grapple with with capitalism um and that that quote that i had earlier from the uh the party about you know making it so that the ruling class can't come back um in terms of uh the political and military uh um arrangements so yeah it's a very thorny thorny question but thank you for your your comment tristan sarah you uh, uh i'm sorry just a minute. I thought. Okay, sorry. Just a minute. Mm-hmm. 
Yamid, your mic is open. Oh. Hello, thank you uh, for uh, all of uh, you know what you had to say. Um, I had a question. You mentioned that uh, you had some uh, experience in the Caribbean. I'm Puerto Rican, and I was wondering, mm -hmm. listening to uh, some of your talk, like the seven methods and the like, um, uh, I was wondering, I was asking if not just about if those um, seven methods of how the ruling class, uh, you know, suppress is mm -hmm. evident if not only do they express themselves in the same way as they do in uh, in a colony like Puerto Rico, but if the way we combat those methods, right? Like, you know, if they, do we express them the same way or is it a different situation? Should we like find a different means of doing it or is it this, you know, same thing? Mm. Wow, well, that's a good question. And I, I think combating uh, combating these methods was was um, is something that, that I think Tony's talk will really have or article will really shed some light on. Um, but I think I think yes, if you look at the global, the global working class, you know, um uh the the way the colonies are um you know colonialization uh is uh is organized also is a way of in disempowering working people. Um so I think I think maybe the mix of those methods is different in in situations of colonialism or or situations like um obtained in Puerto Rico today. Um, but I think yes, those are, are methods. And I think I also want to say, yeah, I, I came up with seven things, but I think there could be others that, you know, I don't think that was an exhaustive list. I think the ruling class has all kinds of um uh tricks up its sleeve and will, you know, use um every means uh possible. So thank you. Yeah, you're right. It would be interesting to to really think deep more deeply about the the parallels between um, the way imperialism is used as a um, as a, a a way of disempowering the working class and and other other forms of disfranchisement. Thanks, Michael. Your mic is open. Michael, hello, Tron Kale. There you are. Yes, that's me. Um, hello, I had a real uh, quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, do you view the overthrow of Roe versus Wade as a way of like splitting gender solidarity maybe? Or could it be a way for men to just control female sexuality and reduce their political power? Um, I don't know, maybe even viewing the female body as like a means of production in and of itself? Hmm. I don't know if it makes sense. But. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I mean, I often think about this, you know, I mean, the, the ruling class really does try to split the ruling class and splitting it along gender lines is one of those ways. Um, I, if you're if you're um, if you're a worker and your your co-worker has an unplanned pregnancy and it's being forced to carry it to term, um, you know, and you're not a person who has uh, the possibility of becoming pregnant, um, that might, you know, introduce inequalities into the workforce that make, um, that, that impinge on the unity of the, of the class. Um, sometimes you find um, people trying to foment um, dissatisfaction among single childless workers for the idea that there's maternity leave. Why should they have maternity leave? They're choosing to have children. You hear that sometimes as, as if, um, you know, the benefits that are handed out, uh, you know, selectively by uh, the ruling class, uh, you know, are, are used to divide us. Um, I don't think, I think it will become clear that uh, this overturning of Roe v. Wade affects everybody, and it's not just women. It's also, uh, you know, women, women's partners and families. Um, it's uh, it's a lot of um, people, and also communities are going to be affected by, in some cases, loss and death among um, among uh, women and, or uh, people of reproductive um, age. Uh, that are forced to undergo, you know, risky pregnancies because they cannot uh, get get access to abortion uh, care. So I'm I'm I think I think it will be, you know, across the board a working class issue. 
um, and uh, in the broadest possible meaning of the working class, everyone who sells their pow labor power are, um, you know, subject to to some kind of uh, restriction because of this this uh, this law this precedent being overturned. Thanks. Interesting question, Michael. Antonio Leon, your mic is open. Like Antonio Leon, there you are. All righty, thank you. Um, first of all, Anita, I want to say, well, let me say, I, this is Antonio calling from Bowie, Maryland. I'm about 10 miles outside wow. of DC, Prince George's yeah. County. Thank and, you. Um, um, Anita, first of all, I loved your presentation. It was Thanks. concise, um, very well delivered, and very informational. And I hope um, uh, we can get a copy back so that I could share it uh, on, on YouTube or in, and in my social media uh, platforms. Um, as far as the struggle uh, against the assault, on democracy, um, I think that we need to always remember that the assault is old and it's going to continue. It's just going to get reformed and refined. Mm -hmm. And so we need to uh, adapt and adjust a as it adjusts moving forward. Um, and in, in where I live, you know, I, when I talk to people uh, about voting, um, there's a lot of apathy out there, um, but but I try to encourage them that, that voting is just the minimum that you can do. Um, we, we need to organize and we need to follow up and 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 force uh, these these uh, um, politicians to do what we want them to do. Um, so you know that's that's uh, uh that that's part of you know the organization and i think that's very important uh because um you know otherwise we're just you know we we don't see what's going on we're like those societal fish you know that that can't discover that that we are um in, in a pervasive environment of hmm. water that's all right thank you Thank you, Antonio. That was really, thank you for your kind words about the presentation. And I will definitely, well, of course, this is being recorded and Dee will make those um, videos available to people who have registered. Um, but I think you're right about um, that, that assault being continuous. And, um, and I think we did have a lot of surprises in 2016 um, about the way uh, social media was used, for example. Um, our, we, we, we weren't maybe up to um, answering that uh, challenge in 2016. And, and one of our adaptations has to be to, to, uh, to look into that. Um, and you're right, voting is the minimum we can do. And there's some, there's some groups on the left, in fact, who, who, um, who, don't, uh, who don't want us to vote, who don't think voting is, matters. But voting, you know, it takes, uh, uh, well, 10 minutes, if you vote early in Ohio, it doesn't really take much time at all. It's, it's nothing. Um, and what you should, what we should be doing is going and registering, uh, I mean, registering other voters, uh, demonstrating at our, um, at our state house or at our uh, elected officials offices, uh, calling our elected officials and holding them accountable to the promises they made. I was, I was thinking this morning about Kirsten Cinema and how she, um, Law, I mean, she ran a campaign promising a lowering of prescription drug prices, and then she turned right around and and, and she's getting large donations from pharmaceutical com companies, and she's just not followed through. And I think people have to really hold her accountable to the promises that she's made. And maybe the next uh, person, if they really see accountability. Uh, will um, will you know take a, a more serious approach to their uh, their um, the promises that they make and what they're able to tell people. So I think um, yeah, but you're right. We have to keep a, uh, after people. And I don't know how to fight that apathy uh, that you mentioned. Um, 
yeah, I'm sure there are some good uh, methods, but I think talking to people about what's on their mind and and if they were if if they were governor tomorrow, uh, what would they do? You know, and that's a way of getting people to think about what their want, their desires are. But thank you, Antonio. One more, Anita. Okay, one more is is good. Dee. Oh, actually, actually, if you want to make summary remarks, we don't have time for one more. Well, let's. Um, well, I, I, um, I'm not sure. I, I have summary remarks, so let's have one more. You know, I. Well, I don't know. Uh, yeah, let's have one more. Question. Giles, Giles, your your mic is open. Giles or Giles. Uh, definitely cannot pronounce your last name. G E E T O O A H. There you are. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm Giles. Um, um you know how the um, all right, how the protests are going with um getting unionizations and stuff. Um, as as much as I see good strides with Starbucks and Amazon. Um, that still ain't gonna stop them from like undermining things later on. I rather I just prop up like worker co-ops across the country and just put big corporate businesses out of businesses. I would rather I go with that approach. I know it's not gonna solve every problem, but at least they won't be around to cause any more trouble for us either. And as for abortion, mm -hmm. Well, I learned something from this guy on Twitter, and he put it in an interesting way. Like, the whole idea behind abortion has nothing to do with morality. It's about changing the cogs of the machine. It's about keeping the labor force going, which I think is a very interesting point. I mean, let's be real. We see what both parties are for what they are. So I wouldn't put it past me if that even merits some truth to it at all. Hmm. <clears throat> Interesting. So, so they want to uh, outlaw abortion to make more babies for the working class. His is mic that... is closed. We're, oh, we've got okay. three minutes. Okay. Well, yeah. Sorry. Um. Uh, well, thank you, Giles, um, for your comments. Um, I, uh, I, I agree that um, you know, protests sometimes seem uh seem difficult. Worker co-ops. They're you know, kind of the utopian um, socialism that you see sometimes on, I can't remember, uh, Eric Olin Wright is a sociologist who was very much involved in those kind of small utopias, um, you know, uh, utopias being um, worker co-ops and things like that. I think they are they are good. I mean, they're not they're not negative. I, I, I think there are some movements um, where those are, are uh, useful but the masses of industrial workers are not in those kind of small co-ops um and i think we, we need to 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 think about that and yes keep the labor force going also keep white babies um getting born i think is another one of those uh subtexts that go go on out with this um so we do have to struggle and i think i mean in terms of summary remarks i think we we uh we uh, you you have um the discussion was really good i i appreciate everybody's um ideas um and questions and you um i think it is good to think about these different categories of um of struggle both in terms of how to how to as uh dial said how to adapt to them or, um, as they change i think that was um uh you giles um and uh, I think those will be that's that's an important strategy to keep in mind that there there are going to be new iterations of these struggles all the time, and we just have to be completely vigilant and and you know tell the history of what uh, how how we and the you know recognition that sometimes these elections do uh, just mean just a handful of votes uh, can change you know can change the Supreme Court you know ultimately so. Um, but thank you all for your comments. I, I wrote down that, them as much as I could take notes on them. And I, I, I look forward with you to um, reading what Tony has to say about the 
kind of the, the flip coin, the other side of the coin, how do, how do working classes struggle for their democratic rights? Um, I look forward to, to hearing what he has to say. And um, thank you so much. I look forward to hearing the, you know, more of, from, the, uh, from other presenters in our, our series. And thank you again, Dee, for your organizing of uh, this National Marxist School. Thank you, Anita, for carrying the baton for this class. Thank everyone for participating. Remember to join us and invite others to join us Tuesday night, uh, this coming Tuesday night, May 10th, I believe it is, at uh, 7.30 Eastern. And we'll be talking about, uh, the class will concern the political economy of the uh, United States. So uh, again, Anita, thank you for carrying the baton for this class and thank you everyone for participating. Please join us Tuesday night, Thursday night, and next Saturday uh, for the to as as we continue the uh this national school, national Marxist school. So good afternoon and happy Mother's Day. Thank you, Anita. <laughs>